here. Okay, Thomas Essen wants to know that in my travels, do I ever seek out specific locations where famous movies were filmed? Not really. Don't get me wrong. Every time I'm in Cleveland, I'm, I'm, I like feel like I'm in a winter soldier nostalgia cloud because so much of the action sequences in Winter Soldier were filmed in and around Cleveland. So it's like, go to Cleveland, you get those Marvel vibes, I dig that. But I don't seek it out while traveling, except for once. Um, I was in Boulder with Will Wheaton and Paul and Storm. We were doing Wootstock, could have been, no idea, 2010 maybe, hard to say. Oh, That's the first time I met Paul F. Tompkins. Anyway, none of that matters. We went to the Mork and Mindy house in Boulder, Colorado. The Mork and Mindy house is still there. It looks exactly like it did in the opening credits of Mork and Mindy. Uh, I grew up with that show. Robin Williams' first, second appearance on American television. His first was playing the character Mork on Happy Days. And oh, wow, Henry Winkler and Anson Williams and Don Most were all at uh, Kansas City Comic Con. I did not talk to any of them. They're just, they're too important. They're too... Henry Winkler was like right next to us and talking and I couldn't say, hi, Mr. Winkler, I'm a huge fan. I've heard he's really nice. I just didn't want to bother him. I really was like overwhelmed with this desire not to bother him. I, the, the can I tell you, a, yeah, I will. I'm going to tell you a thing. The Fonz was without a doubt my earliest possible cosplay. That is the first time I put on clothes that replicated someone I saw and felt that weird magic frisson of like, oh, this is funny and weird. Um, I didn't have, the only two things I had for his outfit, I had a t-shirt, a white t-shirt, and I had blue jeans, but I didn't have a leather jacket. No, I had a jeans jacket, but to me they were like almost identical because I was like seven, eight. Yeah, the Fonz was my first cosplay. Um, okay, uh, that was the Mork and Mindy house. Um, PRM420 <laughs> says, uh, what is the weirdest movie you've ever seen? Mine was Eraserhead. Eraserhead is way up there. Eraserhead is so spectacularly weird. It's, it's upsetting, genuinely. Um, I want to bring up a movie made by Danny Elfman and his brother in the late 70s called Forbidden Zone that is an absolute fever dream. It's up there with Liquid Sky, which is, I think, an X. Yeah, so Liquid Sky is X-rated, not for the... Anyway, uh, Forbidden Zone stars Hervé Villachez, who was a little person that was on um, Fantasy Island with Ricardo Montalban, his... Uh, life ended tragically. Uh, and in this movie, Hervé plays the king of hell. Um, it is, like I said, it's a fever dream. And maybe I haven't said it's a fever dream. It's a total fever dream. Eraserhead is also... I've, so I haven't seen Eraserhead in about 20 years, but I'm getting closer and closer to wanting to watch it and try and figure out for myself how the Eraserhead baby was built. It is one of the great mysteries and props because that object that is the baby from Eraserhead is so spectacularly weird. It's really, it's kind of destabilizing. Um, Ryan Peck says, using the recent Prop Store video as a lead-in on old Hollywood movies, I covered the, uh, the tablets from the Ten Commandments. Um, do you have a favorite silver screen movie from all those years ago? So the very first moment that I was that my brain got interested in film as an art uh, was I was 17 years old and Apocalypse Now was on the television and I wasn't watching it, somebody else was watching it. But as I walked through the room, I saw that shot of Martin Sheen's head, painted, painted face coming out of the water. And I remember being so like, what is that? That's different than any movie I've ever seen. That is like a painting that is so, such a compelling, composition. And then I watched Apocalypse Now and it shifted me on axis. It's so beautiful and so intense and so upsetting. Um, and I started watching more movie movies and started thinking about them more. Like Apocalypse Now was so shifting, it changed the context in which my mind received movies. 
And as I started to watch more and more, uh, I would go to the bookstore in town all the time. I was a big reader. Uh, I am a big reader and have been since I was like 12. And uh, I remember being in the bookstore and seeing this giant blue book, Hallowell's Film Guide. It was the only one. And it was a compendium of like 16,000, 20,000 films. Who made them, when they were made, big uh, a synopsis of the plot, the ca rough cast and other details. And so I bought it. I bought that book and I took it home and I just started flipping through it. I loved books like this. My favorite book at that time in the world was the Book of Lists. Like I, I had the Book of Lists, I had the Book of Lists 2, I had the Guinness Book of World's Records. We didn't have the internet when I was a kid. This is the kind of stuff that, that satisfied for entertainment when your parents wouldn't let you turn on the TV until four or five o'clock. Um, so I loved flipping through books for esoteric facts and Hallowell's Film Guide was awesome. And then as I started going and I was doing the, um, that thing Ioni Sky does with her dictionary and say anything. I was like putting a check mark next to every movie that I'd seen. And as I was doing that, and then I got excited about that, so I started flipping through. And this is when you realize you've not seen a lot of movies. You know, I'm like 17, 18 years old and I'm just crossing off a couple hundred. But what I am noticing as I'm doing this is that Hallowell, the author of this book, is giving all the movies that I like low ratings. Like he's got a star system, like one through five stars. And my movies like Raiders and Star Wars and Moonraker are all getting like one and two stars. And I'm like, what monster gives Raiders two stars? What kind of idiot is this? Let me see what movies he thinks are great. So then I start combing through for a five star movie. And I find this one called The Philadelphia Story. And I'm like, all right. Mr. Hallowell, let's go to the video store and rent this and see how good this black and white movie is. And my life has never been the same. Uh, the Philadelphia Story knocked my socks off. It is so funny and so uh, beautifully acted. It is Jimmy Stewart, Katherine Hepburn, uh, Cary Grant. It's a love story. It's sexual politics are Awful at a couple points. <laughs> There's literally a point. I'm going to tell you the worst moment in the movie. There's little, literally a point when the father of the bride, played by Catherine Hepburn, tells her that the reason he has taken on a 20-year-old lover is because men always want to marry their daughters, and since they never get the full love of their daughters, they have to take young women as their... It's like, what? What kind of... This is the opposite of everything that is reasonable. And yet, and yet, the performance between Hepburn and Grant and Stewart are uh, just among my favorite scenes in movies. I've watched that movie 25 times if I've watched it a single time. And it was an early bonding between me and my wife. Um, the Philadelphia Story is, it's, yeah, it's one of my all time favorite films. Um, I also, look, I love His Gal Friday, which a lot of people will tell you if you love Philadelphia Story, you should watch His Gal Friday. I find its emotionality to be more stilted. And trigger warning, there's a suicide on camera in the middle of this comedy. Literally someone runs through the room and jumps out a window, spoilers. I was really upset by that. I had a lot of trouble recovering from that moment in His Gal Friday. Other old Hollywood movies, uh, sorry, I, before I move off Ryan Peck's question about old Hollywood movies, I wanted to recommend a few others that are completely worth your time. Orson Welles' um, The Trial, which is, I think, full stop the best Kafka adaptation that's ever been put on camera. Um, also Citizen Kane, The Third Man, The 39 Steps, The Lady Vanishes, Early Hitchcock is gonna floor you. Um, we put on It's a Wonderful Life this Christmas. I mean, it's always on, but we put it on this Christmas without sound on during the opening of the presents. And it's a really lovely thing to watch those old black and white movies without sound because man, did they know how to light a room so you could see everything. It, it was like, those, those frames are sculpted like paintings. Thank you for watching that video. Are you as sick of the tosses to membership as I am? Good, because here's a brand new one that I recorded today and it's nice and short. There are three tiers to tested membership and they all offer awesome stuff. Find out about it by clicking the join link below. We'll see you there.